and thanks to the Hilton Foundation uh, for inviting me to be here with all of you this evening. So with Steve and uh, Richard Blewett and uh, Judy Miller and Jane Wales and uh, all of you in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. It's a special pleasure for me to be able to join this impressive gathering of philanthropists, humanitarians, and friends in celebrating the presentation of this prestigious award. And I'm especially pleased to be able to congratulate personally the recipient of this year's Hilton Humanitarian Award, HelpAge International. For almost 30 years now, HelpAge has recognized that support for older people is more than a humanitarian issue. It's also a development issue. Aging is part of poverty and economic growth, labor supply and productivity, gender equality, global savings and public spending for pensions, health care, and other social services. Global aging stands out among demographic shifts. More people are living more years around the world. By 2050, 20% 20 of the world's population will be over age 60. The fastest growth in aging is happening in some of today's youngest countries, in Peru and Nigeria, for example where the number of people over the age of 60 is expected to more than triple by 2050. And in Vietnam, we're almost quadruple by 2050. So what do these numbers mean? They certainly reflect impressive successes in development. People are living longer and healthier lives. At the same time, these demographic trends pose challenges, especially in emerging markets. Across the developing world, countries are growing old before they grow wealthy. China's demographics presents the most dramatic example. By 2030, almost 25% of China's population, that's 350 million people, will be seniors. Yet today, less than a quarter of workers have any form of pension coverage. The world will need to address global aging, so help age will only become more important in years to come. HelpAge is also helping people think freshly about age-friendly health care and the still too rare recognition of the special problems of elderly in humanitarian relief. HelpAge supports the elderly in Darfur by helping provide shelter, literacy programs, and mobile eye care clinics. HelpAge is exploring how solar energy can assist vulnerable people coping with long, cold winters in places like Kyrgyzstan. It's helping to alleviate the impact of HIV and AIDS in one of the poorest areas of Kenya by providing business loans and training to grandparents so that they can secure a sustainable living and support themselves and their families. HelpAge is knowledge and experience is pathbreaking. We will all gain from it. So thank you. Global aging offers just one aspect of how our world has changed over the past 60 years since organizations such as the Hilton Foundation and the World Bank were founded. Both were created in the same year, 1944, when a world war was still raging. Forward-looking individuals were already thinking about how to shape the peace and how to rebuild for the future. That generation, businessmen and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs such as Conrad Hilton, and the policymakers and statesmen who came together at Bretton Woods to devise a new international economic system saw clear connections between economics and security. They had witnessed the failed diplomacy of the 1920s, the global financial breakdown in the 1930s, and the humanitarian horrors of two wars. Hilton promoted his hopes for reconciliation and nonviolence through philanthropy but also through his entrepreneurialism. His hopes for a better post-war world were reflected in a Hilton corporate model, world peace through international trade and travel. The delegates at Bretton Woods planned for peace by building a multilateral framework based on the lessons of the failures after World War I. They created international institutions that encompassed monetary and currency issues, trade, investment, and development, and the reconstruction of broken states coming out of conflict. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, what became the cornerstone of the World Bank Group, was a key element of their design. Now, initially, the World Bank helped reconstruct Western Europe. 
Indeed, the bank's first loan was to France in 1947 for $250 million, which in real terms is still the bank's largest loan to date. But with the Marshall Plan, the bank shifted its emphasis to other parts of the world. Japan became a member in 1952, and the bank broadened its activities, seeking to finance growth and overcome poverty in developing countries. Conrad Hilton participated in rebuilding the post-war world by establishing the Hilton International Hotels in Western Europe and the Middle East. These architectural monuments to modernism were little Americas away from home, spaces that realized the new and powerful reach of the United States. The London Hilton in Park Lane, for example, was the first structure in London that rose higher than St. Paul's Cathedral. In that world, developed economies accounted for about 80% of global GDP, with the United States alone accounting for over 40%. Developed economies accounted for two-thirds of global trade. And most of today's developing economies were still colonies. Russia, China, and even India remained largely isolated from the world economy. That was then. What about today? The international economy is now struggling to recover from the greatest blows since the 1930s. Developing economies are compensating for the stumbling industrial world. Over the past five years, developing economies has provi have provided two-thirds of global growth. Today, China alone is consuming over half the world's cement, about half the world's iron ore, coal, lead, and steel. Half of the world's pigs are eaten in China, and a third of the world's soybeans and eggs. China is the world's biggest consumer of minerals, such as copper and zinc and nickel. Now, these figures may well decline as China is built, yet India and others will follow. For the decade before the financial crisis, economies in sub-Saharan Africa were growing at about 5% a year. Today, most of the African countries have already recovered and returned to that rate. If those growth rates could be maintained, African GDP would double in about 12 years, generating public revenues for investment in people, productivity, and infrastructure unheard of in previous years, and reducing poverty and creating hope. Africa can become a future pole of world economic growth. Half a century ago, the world looked to industrialized countries for development models. Today, developing countries, even as they remain home to billions of poor people, are looking to one another for ideas, whether it's Mexico's and Brazil's conditional cash transfer systems that provide an innovative safety net, Turkey's reform programs, or India's IT services. Developing countries are increasingly sources of investment and even foreign aid. In 2008, new emerging donors contributed between 12 and 15 billion dollars in development aid. That's equivalent to about 10 to 15 percent of the amount contributed by traditional developed country donors, and that's likely a conservative estimate. The dynamics of the international economy have shifted radically since 1944. Even the changes in the last few decades since organizations <clears throat> such as HelpAge began in 1983, have been immense. The past quarter century has seen more people make greater strides to overcome poverty than in all of the world's history. The number of poor and developing countries has been cut in half. So what does all of this mean for the future? It means that we can't keep using the models of yesterday for the world economy of today and tomorrow. The economic and security problems of the 1940s have changed drastically. Yet recall those topics on the agenda at Bretton Woods. Currencies and exchange rates, trade and investment, reconstruction of broken states and development, and then reflect on the news that you read today. These issues remain very current, although the context is vastly different. When I came to the World Bank in 2007, many questioned whether the World Bank was even necessary in a world in which private sector capital flows to developing countries had dwarfed public development assistance. But I had a different vantage point, gained from some historical perspective, personal experience, 
and my sense of the international landscape. Institutions matter. The World Bank was never simply about loans and grants. Its role has been, and remains, to develop market economies in an open international economic system, fostering growth and opportunity and hope, and overcoming poverty within a better political and security order. There's enormous potential for addressing these challenges, with new development partners providing fresh ideas and resources, and new information and technology to help us solve some very old problems. But we need a new model that connects all the global players. We need a modernized multilateralism that is fluid and flexible, in which emerging economies join new networks of countries, international institutions, foundations, civil society organizations, and the private sector. Just as the international economy has changed over the past half century, the World Bank has also changed. Today, the World Bank Group consists of four policy and financing arms. That original International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which provides long-term loans at very attractive rates. The International Development Association, or IDA, which is a special fund of grants and credits for the 79 poorest countries. The International Finance Corporation, IFC, which is our private sector arm. And the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, which offers insurance against political risk. To work better within this changed world economy, international institutions and regimes, including the World Bank Group, need to modernize too. Some look at today's multilateral nations and they see only their weaknesses and their failures. And they advocate abandoning these organizations altogether. I've suggested a different perspective. The world's multilateral bodies offer a very thin but vital connecting tissue that draws together sovereign nations that pursue common interests. The pragmatic approach is to make these institutions, with all their imperfections, work better. So this evening, I'd like to share with you five lessons that I've learned at the World Bank Group. First, we need to do development with clients, not to them. Developing economies are the World Bank's clients and partners, not objects of policy. It's an important but essential shift of mindset. Clients have vastly different needs. If the best textbook solution doesn't fit the client's political economy context, then we haven't helped solve the problem. Now, the focus on clients may seem like common sense, but I was struck during the debate over the next president of the World Bank how some academics and economists were repeating the errors of the past. They thought that they knew the three or four areas to focus on for developing countries. I preferred to listen to our clients. My approach has been to apply the World Bank Group's unique experience and research, combined with innovative finance, to address what our developing clients tell us matters to them. No one size can fit all. Take countries dealing with fragility and conflict. In 1944, the R and IBRD stood for the reconstruction of Europe and Japan. Today, countries such as Afghanistan, Cote d'Ivoire, Haiti, Liberia, and South Sudan need to find ways to combine security and development so they can break the cycles of fragility and violence, poor governance, and poverty. These countries are home to what Paul Collier of Oxford University termed the bottom billion, actually about a billion and a half people, who can't start climbing the ladder of growth and opportunity and whose problems spill over to harm their neighbors. The World Bank has created a new hub in Nairobi that will help us to become more flexible and faster in supporting these fragile states while building knowledge about what works best. Other countries are the source of vast mineral or energy resources. The key challenge for these lands is good governance, to fight corruption, avoid the Dutch disease of imbalanced growth, and to invest in inclusive and sustainable development. Middle-income countries have a different set of needs. These countries, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey, and others, are today's most dynamic emerging economies. And it's hard to imagine any significant problem of the world's economy, environment, or increasingly diplomacy and security that can be addressed without their involvement. 
Yet these countries still face enormous development challenges. They're home to some 75% of the people still living under $2 a day. They still need the bank's assistance, but increasingly important to them is the sharing of knowledge and experience, and then to encourage them to assume greater international responsibilities. Our middle-income clients are seeking the World Bank's group in helping understand how to avoid the so-called middle-income trap. In 1960, 101 economies were classified as middle income. But by 2008, only 13 had made it to high income. For example, China and the World Bank recently completed something called the China 2030 Report, which is a joint study of the strategic issues confronting China's development prospects over the next 20 years. The report aims to be a practical guide for China's policymakers but it offers key insights to other middle-income countries that face many of the same challenges that does China. Now, the World Bank put our problem-solving approach to work when developing countries were hit by the soaring food and fuel prices at the end of 2007. Some World Bank economists, thinking in aggregate terms, said that returns from high commodity prices would allow most countries to offset the danger. Others suggested that the problem would be best handled by humanitarian agencies, not by long-term development institutions. But tens of millions of people had no cushion to soften the blow. Families were going without meals. Farmers couldn't get the inputs they needed. Food riots broke out. It made no sense to speak of the long-term unless populations and governments could address their short-term needs. So we addressed critical short-term needs by working with UN agencies to set up a global food crisis response program and to create a rapid financing facility to support farmers. But at the same time, we recognize an opportunity to promote longer term growth by promoting productivity and production. Today, the bank's investments across agriculture run the whole value chain, from research to property rights, including for female farmers, to seeds, irrigation, fertilizer, storage, and marketing, and always encouraging private sector development. When the food and fuel crises were overtaken by a global financial crisis in 2008, the World Bank mobilized more than $220 billion of financial commitments to support developing countries, dispersing much of it rapidly. Equally important was that we tried to address specific market breakdowns by expanding trade finance, recapitalizing banks in developing countries, purchasing distressed assets. We worked with others to meet specific regional needs, for example, a credit contraction in Central and Eastern Europe, and borrowing backstops to permit expansionary budgets in Southeast Asia. So today, the bank continues to work with all its clients, but also with attention to the fundamental long-term investments to lay the foundations for recovery, especially infrastructure, safety net programs to protect the poor and human capital, and financing for the private sector. Second, the new global economy demands diverse and innovative financing. Every three years, the bank needs to replenish its fund for the poorest countries, the IDA. Even now, during a period of financial limitations, the World Bank shareholders, its 187 member countries, decided that the institution's priorities and performance warranted first-rate financial support. So in 2007 and in 2010, we had two record-breaking IDA replenishments that raised more than $90 billion. And in 2010, the shareholders also backed our first IBRD capital increase in more than 20 years, which enabled us to meet client needs at a time of crisis and maintain our AAA rating. To make the most effective use of these funds for our clients, we have to be innovative. So, for example, we're helping countries and farmers manage systematic risks through financial innovation to counter weather variability, such as droughts. We established a crisis response window to help low-income countries deal with the impact of natural disasters, such as the 2010 earthquake in Haiti <clears throat> and severe economic shocks. We, we brought financial innovation to bear on plans to develop medicines, to lower the costs of humanitarian food and supplies, support biodiversity, and create natural disaster insurance. Now, a good example of how we can use innovative financing to produce results through partnering with foundations 
is the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, a partnership among the bank, the Gates Foundation, and the United Nations Foundation. Through this program, foundations pay off the present value of a country's IDA credits when the country has successfully completed a vaccine distribution program to eliminate portfolio. In essence, this program allows developing countries to mobilize ultimately what becomes grant funding to eradicate portfolio, but only if the money has been deployed to achieve results. To date, the program has provided $147 million to deal with polio eradication in Nigeria and Pakistan, and it hopes to scale up to support areas such as routine immunization and maternal child health. The World Bank Group has also developed novel ways to finance and tackle environmental issues. We were able to raise over $7 billion for governments, from governments for new climate investment funds to help countries improve energy efficiency and technology, lower their carbon emissions, and protect against climate change. With these funds, we were able to mobilize over $50 billion worth of projects in 45 developing countries. So as negotiators debate what a green fund may look like, the World Bank has one up and running. Third, the private sector is the main engine for jobs and innovation. Now, the bank's private sector development begins with public policies to strengthen the environment for investment, whether domestic or foreign, including through an educated, skilled, and healthy workforce. The bank's doing business report helps countries assess how they compete with others in empowering entrepreneurs, particularly smaller businesses. IFC invests in and also provides technical assistance to companies and financial enterprises that can support developing country businesses and markets. IFC makes its own investments, but is increasingly mobilizing other investors to join in. IFC is also investing in building markets for investment and innovation. For example, IFC is committing about $3 billion through about 180 private equity funds to build markets through which investors can supply long-term risk capital to owners of local companies. And I was especially pleased that in 2010, IFC created a new asset management company that supplements the traditional model of raising money in bond markets and then investing it. The AMC taps sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and other institutional investors and channels their investments to profitable opportunities that have been identified by IFC. This venture opens up an entirely new channel of financial intermediation. The AMC already totals about $4 billion, about $3 billion of which had little previous exposure to Africa and other less recognized emerging markets. Fourth, we need to democratize development. One of the many messages that of the crowds that shook the Middle East in 2011 was that global economic freedom must be combined with good governance, citizen voice, and social accountability. These are crucial for economic development. Inclusive and sustainable development depends on shifting from an elite top-down approach to one that empowers individuals and communities. For development institutions, this means investments in civil society and social accountability are as important to development as investments in infrastructure, firms, factories, and farms. The World Bank has been supporting civil society organizations for almost 30 years, but now we're ramping up that engagement. Later this week, I'll be announcing the formation of a new global partnership for social accountability, a dedicated partnership to provide long-term support to civil society groups in developing countries that are working on keeping their governments accountable. Over the next four years, the World Bank plans to put in about $20 million of seed money to get the partnership going and to raise what I hope will be a much larger fund. And I hope that this new partnership becomes an integral part of the bank group's work going forward. But democratizing development also means giving people the tools to gather data and to assess the knowledge and information to better understand development issues, along with opportunities to share insights. We're seeing the power of sharing information through true two transformative policies that the bank rolled out in 2010 that are making the institution more accessible, transparent, and accountable. Our new access to information policy releases vast numbers of documents, 
giving the public more information than ever before about the bank's projects, its analytic and advisory activities, and the proceedings of their board. We modeled this on the Freedom of Information programs in India and the United States, and it's the most extensive such policy of any multilateral organization. Our open data initiative makes thousands of data sets freely available to anybody with an internet connection. From a PhD student in Australia to a farmer in Kenya, they can download our data, analyze it, and come up with their own solutions. The bank is also working with communities to map their own social infrastructure, whether it be health clinics, schools, water sources, so villagers can hold officials to account. And the next step is that we want to allow people to use handheld devices to let the bank know from any location what's really going on with the projects. Now this data is already being used in an innovative partnership with the Hewlett Foundation, the African Economic Research Consortium, and the African Development Bank to produce new indicators that measure the quality of health and education services in Sub-Saharan Africa. These indicators will be an important tool for governments in monitoring results, as well as for citizens, parents in particular, to challenge poor governance. Democratizing development is the key to modernization that is not just based on government attentions or experts' theories, but instead a rigorous commitment to results, openness, and accountability. Both donors and recipients are properly insisting on value for their money. My fifth and last point is the need to promote good governance and to combat corruption. Now, the World Bank has a fiduciary duty to ensure that our funds are being used for their intended purposes. It's outrageous to steal from the poor. But our anti-corruption work has to go further than that. Governments need to take ownership if these efforts are going to succeed. They need to be accountable, too. The World Bank is investigating corruption and bringing cases against those that commit fraud and theft. We've set up a preventative unit to try to learn from experience, especially in sectors such as roads that are prone to fraud and threat theft. But we have to do more. We have to set standards, live them, and promote their broader adoption. Now, the bank can help build institutions that prevent corruption, improve transparency, and involve civil society in supporting good governance. The bank can also help governance, governments increasingly at the subnational level to strengthen their financial management, their procurement systems, auditors, and other systems that will promote accountability. But we're still going to have to break through harder obstacles. We put some new tools in place, including an agreement with our counterparts in the region of development banks on cross-debarment of firms and individuals that cheat or steal. We've added new penalties. We added something called the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative, or STAR, that will assist governments in recovering funds that are stolen by people who've looted their country's treasuries. And we've started an International Corruption Hunters Alliance to support the investigators and prosecutors and judges and others who often take on extraordinarily dangerous work. So I hope tonight I've been able to give you an idea of why modernizing multilateralism is important and a little bit of a sense of what it's meant for the World Bank Group. Over time, the World Bank's aim should be to help countries take another step, to move beyond aid. There will always be a need for humanitarian aid, and for some time to come, poor and conflict-riven countries are going to require development assistance. The goal, however, should be to move beyond dependency. Our aim should be to shift from a paradigm of charity to one of mutual economic benefit. So what would such a world look like? It would provide poor countries better access to world markets while allowing them to hedge against fluctuating commodity prices, spiking fuel costs, natural disasters. It would facilitate foreign direct investment, innovative financing, and technological transfer so that developing countries can modernize their industry, agriculture, and services. It would support good governance and openness, transparency, to ensure that governments pay more attention to citizen voice and social accountability, and that private sector initiative is rewarded, basic services delivered, and prosperity broadly shared. It would support multilateral innovation to forge progress, to open trade and investment, access to energy, food security, competition and services, 
and climate change. It would support innovative partnerships between government, international institutions, the private sector, civil society groups, and foundations, so that these actors could leverage each another's strengths, share experience, and learn from each other and work together to bring better development solutions. It would be a world in which all countries could tap the energies and genius of all young people, the elderly, not least girls and women, an underrealized source of growth everywhere. Now, much of the World Bank's history has been associated with the third world. That term no longer fits today's reality. After all, with the end of the Cold War and the demise of the second world, developing countries should at least move up one. But more to the point, developing countries are not just some subsidiary category. They're diverse, they're growing, economically and in influence, they want more voice, and they want to be stewards of their own futures. The third world is now an outdated concept, but development is not. In fact, lessons of development, just like principles of sound economics, are increasingly applicable to all countries. And that is what modernizing multilateralism should really be all about. Learning from the past, adapting for the present, and creating for the future. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.